Um, hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for being here for this really exciting and fun event. Um, my name is Lori Black. I'm the Associate Director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience here at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. Um, if any of you are interested in what we're doing and you're interested in music of American Jewish experience, please follow us uh, by going to the link that is now in the chat and you will find uh, a place to sign up for our sign up for our mailing list and our mailing list. You will get all of the information about all the exciting events that we're doing throughout the year. And there are a lot of them um, upcoming. Just a, a few of the exciting things that we have coming up. October 26th, we will be offering a Mizrahi music workshop with Sa Dr. Sam Thomas, uh, who um, has specialties in a number of different Sephardic and Mizrahi traditions. Uh, and he'll be playing uh, several different instruments and teaching us uh, the practice. And we'll each get to learn how and participate. And then on November 14th, uh, Sunday at 9.30 a.m., uh, will be the third installment of our lecture uh, symposium uh, Kol Nidre Audiovisual Dramaturgies, and you will find all the information for that online. I would also like to give a thank you to our co-presenters at the National Museum of American Jewish History and our dear friend Dan Samuels, who helps coordinate this. Um, uh, we, they are wonderful partners. We partnered on a number of programs, and we will continue to have programs throughout the year with them. Um, upcoming for them is uh, a wonderful program in a series, the Songs of Our People, Songs of Our Neighbors. Uh, the final episode of the calendar year is featuring the Grammy Award winning Santaro and Afro-Cuban percussion master Pedrito Martinez. Uh, and that's Tuesday, October 26th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So we're very excited to introduce our uh, the, 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 the true guest and, uh, and um, it's really our honor to have him here. Uh, Oklahoma born, Texas reared and now living in New Orleans. Multi-instrumentalist Mark Rubin is an unabashed Southern Jew known equally for his muscular musicianship and larger than life persona. In this interactive program, Rubin uh, is sharing insights into the album, The Triumph of Assimilation. Over an accomplished 30 plus year career, Ruben has accompanied or produ uh, produced a virtual who's who of American traditional music while straddling numerous musical genres, including country, western swing, bluegrass, Cajun, Tex-Mex, uh, klezmer, the list goes on. He is perhaps best known for co-founding the notorious proto-Americana band Bad Livers, though his more recent work as a first call tuba and bass player in the klezmer music scene has now earned him equivalent notoriety. His credits in the Jewish music world include longtime collaborations with Frank London's Klezmer Brass All-Stars, the other Europeans, and Andy Statman, as well as decades on faculty at Klez Camp. I'm incredibly, uh, we are incredibly lucky to have Mark Rubin here. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, <laughs> oh there you are. Hey, looky there. Hey, wow. I, I, you're talking. You were talking about me. <laughs> well, that was so Sorry. nice. Sorry. <laughs> gosh, it's a gosh, it's a genuine, genuine. I can't tell you how pleased and honored I am here to be with y'all and to get a chance to share my music with you. I'm just so charmed. I can't tell you. So uh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you to the uh, both uh, both you folks there and uh, and at the National Museum. Uh, 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 thank you so much for doing this. And I, I, I'm I'm humbled. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Um, so the first tune that we're going to be hearing tonight. Uh, so this is correct me if I'm wrong. This is the only one that's not on on this new album. Yes. Um, yes, sir. Southern Jews is good news. Tell us a mm -hmm. little bit about this and what we can expect uh, from from this really interesting tune. Well, uh, it's a this is by by ways of introduction. It's kind of a musical introduction to kind of let you know. Uh, where I'm coming from, where I am from, and kind of what, what it was like to be a Jewish person in a small town in Oklahoma. Um, I got the line, Southern Jews is good news, uh, from a uh, comedian named uh, Southern uh, Brother Dave Gardner, who was one of the original like uh, redneck comedians back in the 60s. And he had a, he had a, a, a routine called The Great Religions of the World where he kind of poked fun at each one of the different religions and he got to the, he got to the Jews and he goes, now the Jews, and you can just you know, hear a pause. And he goes, now 
don't get me wrong, uh, dear hearts, Southern Jews is good news. It's just the Yankees I'm worried about. So I, that's where I got my that's where I got my hook. And I then uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a trigger warning, friends and neighbors. Um, uh, there is some coarse language in this uh, in this song towards the end. Um, there's a there's a descriptive uh, some language here at the end, which some folks may find uh, troubling. However, this is a phrase that my father gave to me whenever I was challenged by a bigot. And so, and that happened uh, in my life a lot when I was a young man growing up in Oklahoma. And so uh, one of the things that you did whenever a bigot would come and challenge you, uh, you were kind of had to throw it back at him. And so uh, that's, that's your trigger warning on this tune here. It's called Southern Jews is a good news. Well, Southern Jews are good news, baby. Well, uh, Southern Jews is a damn good news. Southern Jews are good news, baby. Well, it's just them Yankees I'm worried about. Don't even lose You got them Jews up in Oklahoma, huh? Ask the average landsman. You got them down in Tennessee, down in Mississippi, down in sunny old Alabama. Well, heck yes, I say, Max's Shunnus lead is this to you, great news. Cause New York City seems a mighty exotic to a Southern Jew. You know, we're mostly in the agribusiness, business, just like Tevya milking cows. You can pick our farms out from the rest by the absence of any sound. You know, our Yankee kids, poor manners, you know, we often must excuse. No pigs in a poke, no, we hate no joke, we're the down home Southern Jews. Let me tell you about it. We take our bacon off of our cheeseburgers and we greet you with a howdy, y'all. We drive the shoe on shops in our best dressed overalls. You know, we're famous for our barbecue. It's kosher beef, so you can't refuse. Got a trucker cap from a keeper. It's a scramble of the Southern Jews. Yeah, that Southern Jews are good news, baby. Well, uh, Southern Jews is a damn good news. Well, uh, Southern Jews are good news, baby. Well, it's just them Yankees I'm worried about. Now, here you go. Some down here, they say we pass for white. Well, at least we ain't black. Well, it might be true for some down here, but you always got to watch your back. Well, our skin tone gives us much relief, and some days we get to choose. You got to navigate your privilege when you live as a Southern Jew. Let me tell you about Judah Benjamin, the Confederate Secretary of State. On that particular question, friends, well, we wind up inside of hate. In the war of northern aggression, y'all might think you got a higher score. But if you look down south today, you gotta say y'all sure enough lost that war. Did we kill your lord? Heck yes, we did. Bring him back and we'll kill him again. And the good old boys all belly laugh, cause we're all the best of friends. Well, that sort of talk I might shock you. In fact, it might confuse. But it's source like this all the live long day when you live as a Southern Jew. Well, now, Southern Jews are good news, baby. And uh, Southern Jews is a damn my good news. Southern Jews are good news, baby. Well, it's just them Yankees I'm worried about. Don't be do 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 Thank you so much for that. That's what Daddy said to say. <laughs> you know, I mean, I well, I, I, as you know, and we we got to talk about this offline, but as a, a Jew growing up in Southern California and in one of the most Jewish neighborhoods in the United States, I didn't really, you know, I I, I learned so much about you and about Jewish uh, Southern Jewish culture just by listening to your music um you know the, oh. the, well it you tell a story you really do um and I, I i mean and as i i hope everyone's going to learn about you as as we go through the course of this evening that your music really does kind of take you through what the southern jewish experience is and um and, and how there's different ways to express 
what being a Jew is. Um, don't let me put words in your mouth. Tell me I, I'm wrong, but that's really no, what well, I drew from it. Well, I appreciate that. I, I, I don't want to speak for all Jews down, down here. I'm an Oklahoma Jew. I am the Jew of Oklahoma. For instance, I said we're mostly in the agribusiness. That's not true. Um, the Jews around me were mostly uh, milkers. Mm. They, they were mostly okay. dairy farmers and mostly in the, into bovine engineering, as we used to call it. And when I was a kid, um, my father, uh, who was raised on a ranch in Arizona, he would be damned if I was going to be a city boy. So he sent me over to old Pop Levine's uh, to go milk the cows and uh, clean out the stalls and run the tractor uh, and help him with his dairy business on the Sundays because there wasn't anything to do on Sunday in a, <laughs> in a Church of Christ town like Stillwater, Oklahoma. So I'm 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 hope I'm painting a picture for myself that that other people can relate to and I, and I. I I, it's not just, it's not just, uh, I've been, you know, I've, I did my show up in uh, Canada one time and, uh, a fellow who uh, was born and raised in rural Ontario came up and, and talked to me and, and he, he, he said that he could relate to that experience as well. Wow. It's, it's not just, it's, it's not just Southern Jews, but it's, it's a Jewish experience of the rural of the, of, of kind of like the, the rural and the, um, uh, and the marginalized if that makes sense. Interesting. And arguably not, not one that we necessarily talk that much about. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, like, we're not I'm on not the radar. It, you are, right? <laughs> well, we're only, we've only, uh, according to the 2020 census, we're uh, 1% of the South. Wow. wow. You know, yeah, you so know. that's pretty significant. You know, and so uh, I, I don't, I don't like, you know, I, I kind of want to, I want to speak for myself, but I, I hope I'm speaking for others. And that, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of what I, I hope, I hope that my music is doing and I hope folks can find something in it. And I, I hope well, as we share the music tonight, that we can tell some stories. Well, I think that is a great segue into uh, your album. So we're going to start with an actual track from the album before we get into some of the live playing from it. Um, mm -hmm. And so can you just give us a, a short, how did this, what, so, I mean, the album, it, title itself the triumph of assimilation it you know tells a little bit about who you are what your musical what your music musical style is and and what your story is but can you you know give us a little bit the 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 how, how this project came together and then just a little bit about uh the first tune that we're going to hear day of revenge well thank you for asking the question um you know the triumph of assimilation is a it's a it's a it's a phrase that's been banging around in my head a lot, and it's uh, frankly it's more a question than it is an answer. Um, uh, you ask what the impetus behind this record was, and the impetus behind this record was, um, you, you know, uh, <laughs> anti-Semitism uh, basically, um, and that the rise of anti-Semitism and the rise of fascism in the United States. And, uh, I made this record during our COVID times and, uh, and watched, you know, watched everything go down on television, like everybody else. And you know who I thought of in all of this, I thought of Mordecai Ghiberti, um, is who came to mind. And you might ask yourself, how does a Oklahoma boy, uh, find out about a Polish poet? Um, a, a poet, you know, who's, who wrote exclusively in Yiddish, but, you know, it's, it's my many, many years uh, working in the uh, Yiddish uh, Renaissance uh, as a musician and a musical educator. I've been really, really blessed to uh, be around some of the greatest Yiddishists that there are. And uh, it's amazing uh, that I've been exposed to uh, literally the, the people it's at Gottesman and, uh, yeah. and Michael Wex, and uh, when it comes to the Yiddish language, the people who have been reinvigorating it and uh, translating and, and uh, teaching and educating people about it, um, I've I've had this wellspring next to me. Now, do I speak Yiddish? No, I do not. I am pretty well for, thoroughly assimilated, uh, like a lot of people my age. I'm 55 years old. Uh, Yiddish was spoken by my grandparents as a way to... Uh, uh, you know, have a secret language that we didn't know, and they forced uh, mm -hmm. their their kids to speak English, and it's, it's the old story uh, of assimilation. But the thing about Gebertig is, he was writing his work 
at a time of the rise of fascism <laughs> in, in, in Eastern Europe. And he saw it. And he, in many ways, and sometimes experienced it and ultimately experienced it in the most, in, in the, in the most terrifying of ways. Um, and if you're not familiar with Mordecai Gebertig, I'm not going to waste our time today. I want you to, to, this is a good, good way for you to, to look it up, you know, use the interwebs and, and, and do some research. But I felt that the power of his message was so important and prescient for today and that n- not just for Jews, Jews in particular, American Jews in particular, but for Americans, period, this message was so important. And for year, like 20 years ago, I recorded a Gebertig song, and, it, it, and my singer sang it in beautifully in Yiddish. And all of these songs are sung by wonderful singers today with great heart and emotion and pleading, but in Yiddish. And unfortunately, the people that I feel need to hear this, who need to hear this music, and who, um, pardon me, music, who need to hear this message, the people that this needs to land with, they're like me. They are Jew-ish sometimes, um, you know, <laughs> and who, who are a, a generation removed from Yiddish, but they shouldn't be a generation removed from our activism and our, 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 our justice and our recognition of that this can all happen again. Yeah. You know, my dad said, we live in history. You know, we, we live in history. Don't let it pass you by. And there's nobody who uh, exemplified that in his work more, you know, I think, than Mordecai Gilberti. And so I'm also a fan of the great country Western singer, uh, songwriter Harlan Howard who could take lyrics and just state them very plainly, lay out things in a really, that, that would rhyme and that would lay out really plainly. So in my own way, I wanted to take the message of Gebertig and kind of transadapt it into English using the tools that I had as an American country musician, inspired by people like Ralph Stanley and, 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 and Harlan Howard and Ray Price, you know, and, and, Amer- and, and, and the American vernacular. And, and yeah. This first Magicians. song, uh, A Day of Revenge, does it come from a particular text or a particular story? Particular oh, yeah. Place? Yeah, this is, <laughs> the, this is, this is, this is from Gebertig's song, mm-hmm. A Tug for Nekoma, uh, The Day of Revenge. This is, uh, this is a real gut punch of a, of a piece of text. Um, and I, I stuck really close to it, but it's one of those, it, but to me, by the time you get through the end of the text, you have to hold on. It's like a good story. You have to hold on to this story and go to the end. I feel that Gebertig shares with us the quintessential response to the Jewish response to injustice. I think that that it that it that Gebertig shows us the Jewish response to hatred and injustice, and so that's what I wanted to get across in my retelling of this Gebertig song. Fantastic! Let's give it a listen. <laughs> Suffering and pain, revenge for those who still remain. Oh, that day will come along when we right each every wrong. There'll be revenge for the widows, orphans. It must suffice 
But a million's blood since sacrificed Our prophets cry out for us to awake For retribution so shall we take We'll have revenge for the suffering and pain Revenge for those who still remain Oh, that day will come along When we right each every wrong There'll be It's coming here like Noah's dove A message of kindness, peace, and love That's our revenge For the suffering and pain Revenge For those who still remain Oh, that day will come along When we right each every wrong That's how revenge Uh, Mark, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, oh there we go. 1940. 1940. Smuggled out. One of those texts that was smuggled out. Um, that's how we know about it. Wow. Pretty, pretty amazing. Now, the next one that we're going to hear, you're going to play live, is yeah. kind of a Gebertig standard. This is mm -hmm. one of the, uh, another one of the ones that you, know, <coughs> when you think of Mordechai Gebertig. This is one of the ones at the top of the pile. Um, and, I, and this one in particular, for, at least for me, this one in particular, I think really it, it shows just how you really, um, you know, kind of process something in your own musical language. And so if you just wanted to talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, this is this is a song that I've, I've I've it's been in my life for decades. Um, like I said, I recorded this as a Yiddish piece, a very overwrought and piece uh, twenty years ago um, with with a group. So um, I have performed it over and over again with lots and lots of people. Um, but uh, I always thought of it as a murder ballad. It's it's about a murder of a shtetl. And uh, uh, so anyone on this call that doesn't know what a murder ballad is, could you just give us? Oh, the, sure. The two um, seconds. In American folk music, there is a there's a tradition um, that goes way, way back um, all the way to the tradition of the bards where they would tell these stories. Um, there was a particular kind of story that where somebody dies and it's it's uh, it's a it's a form of a song called a, a murder ballad. And they're very plaintive and lonesome. And they have. <laughs> they oftentimes have these modal modal sounds to them, which are, you know, that sound less than Western sometimes. And so um, that, and that that's called the mountain modal tuning. And, and so I was, I was always drawn to that sound because it, it has, it has a similar modality to some of the cantorial music when it's played. You know? And, uh, I, I always I, I saw kind of like a, a not a direct line but kind of an interesting line between those two things the 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 murder ballad this murder of this this Jewish shtetl and the the Appalachian American folk tradition of the singing and the telling of a tale and uh, I, I I only used a little bit of Gebertig in this in this version I wrote a lot of my own stuff to it so it's a trans adaptation and uh, mm -hmm. But uh, this, I built the whole record basically around this tune. I, I wrote, uh, I wrote this tune and recorded it, and then uh, uh, it just the whole the whole record just kind of fell out from this. And so uh, I'll, I'll sing you a little bit of this right now. Uh, S. Brandt is its Yiddish title. Um, it's burning. <laughs> It's burning, yes, it's 
it's burning Everywhere it's burning down But your arms are crossed and you're staring round It's burning Yes, it's burning Said it's burning Listen up, you whole damn fools Pick up a bucket, you got the tools It's burning Said they're going around and taking names Putting every home to the flames It's burning and if there was any doubt, there ain't no fireman to put it out. It's burning. Uh -huh. are swallowing up our town but your arms are crossed and you're staring down it's burning well there ain't no rain there ain't no flood we'll quench these fires with our blood it's burning yes it's burning said it's burning everywhere it's burning round but your arms are crossed and you're staring down it's burning Yes, it's burning, said it's burning. Listen up, you whole damn fools. Pick up a bucket, you got the tools. It's I love that line, pick up the bucket, you've got the tools. You're, you're you're really giving a proactive message, you know. I mean, you're telling you're, it's a call to action. Right. It's not too late. Yeah. It's not too late. In Gebertig, there is hope. In in Judaism, there is hope. I mean, you know, you're not uh, you're not off the hook. <laughs> Like, uh, like my, you know, my rabbi has two things he likes to say. The more things change, the more they're like the 15th century. <laughs> 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 and then the other thing he says is when something really bad happens, he goes, something really bad happens. That means something good is going to have to come out of it, you know? And uh, there's, there's something, you know, I'm, I'm a big downer. Like I'm a big, I'm a manic depressive. So I'm, prone to depression myself but in Gepertig there's this there's hope and that it's a Jewish hope and that's that's part of my message if there's any anything else that I've got to add well we're gonna jump into some correct me if I'm wrong some solo instrumental music now oh yeah let me let me talk a little bit about the band yeah please well, the banjo in uh, is not really native to, to Jewish music, but Jews seem to be really involved in the banjo. There are a lot of Jewish people. Oh, that's the dog, thank God. Uh, there, there's a lot of Jewish people who are really into the banjo, and it it uh, it's 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 strange to me that there aren't more Jewish people who have adapted the banjo. Uh, to Jewish music, uh, it's I, I don't know why, uh, because many, many, many Jewish people have become expert, and I do mean expert at the at the instrument. And uh, everywhere I go, uh, when I play jam sessions, I meet I meet folks, and they're just so good at it. But they they can play all kinds of American music and all kinds of other music, but they don't know any of their own tunes. It's very strange to me. But um, there are some pioneers in the banjo in America, and one of those is uh, Mr. Henry Sapoznik, who, uh, uh, was, uh, gr who is a great old-time banjo and classic banjo player, and he worked out some music for it a long time ago. And there's a guy named Andy Rubin, uh, no relation to me, uh, who had a group called the Frylock Makers String Band, uh, who did some great 
old time uh, uh, banjo playing as well. So it's nothing new, but like, um, I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of guys who, uh, uh, sit around and pick and a lot of them are Jewish fellas. And I, what I kind of want to do is I kind of want to like develop a repertoire for them, you know, like, a like have like a little repertoire of tunes that they can sit around the fireplace. Cause you know, they sit around and play Angeline the Baker all night and they sit around, you know what I mean? They sit around and play Sally Gooden all night. Surely, um, you know, they can pick some, uh, some fun Jewish tunes. And, uh, I thought, I thought maybe I'd record some, uh, the DJs are really liking it. Uh, the DJs are really playing a lot of them. Uh, so, uh, let me, let me do this. Let me, let me play you a couple of those numbers. What do you say? What do you say? So uh, maybe I should play you, uh, let me play one that's not on the record, but it's fun. Oh. See, here's the problem. Half of your time is, is spent. Here's the here's thing about the banjo. Half of your time is spent tuning it, and the rest of your time is played is is spent playing out of tune. Thank you. 
<laughs> Pretty good, man. Pretty good for a colonized instrument, man. For an African instrument, completely colonized by Americans, uh, put into the industrial age, and then uh, appropriated by all kinds of cultures, including ours now. I, I mean, it's such a different way to hear that. Very, some very familiar tunes. Um, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. If we could just take a second, real quick, because like what you were doing the the with your thumb, I think that's that's claw hammer. No, claw hammer. That's what it's called. It's called a claw hammer. Claw hammer. Wait, can you lean closer to the mic? Now see, it's got an African backbeat. See, it's yeah. got doon daggy doon daggy doon daggy doon. Now see, uh, African music and and Jewish music never the Twain did meet. See, mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of a conflict built in inherently into the instrument. So one of the things that I do to kind of fight that is I try and put the 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 Jewish clave and that I try really hard to insert as best I can, and that's the Jewish clave is the Bulgar rhythm, which is a distinctly Jewish rhythm. So I really work to go. So I work really, really hard to to to, to fit that in to kind of give it the tom. You know what I mean? Just to give it a little, to give it a little Yiddish atom, you know, to, 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 you know, to create a, a Jewish approach to the instrument. And, you know, the idea is, is, you know, the, the, the banjo, uh, unless you're a, you know, a super masterful player, isn't going to hit all the notes of the melody. It's going to line out the melody enough to where you will recognize it. And the thing is, is that I'm reminded of the other immigrant groups that I know that, that exist in the South, like the Czechs and the Poles and the, and the, and the Hispanic people that I work with, you know, their European traditions that, that they brought with them when they, when they moved, you know, they got removed from the mainstream of European culture and then their versions of the music kind of mutated mm -hmm. a little bit. And then they, and they kind of, sometimes it kind of simplified and they kind of lost, they lost sections of the tunes and everything. And it all just became kind of like this new thing, like, like amongst the French people um, that moved here, it turned into Cajun music and to where it became like, it became unrecognizable to the original French music that they learned from. So I'm in my own way, that's kind of how I approach my learning these tunes. I'm not trying to learn them, um, down pat what i'm trying to do is i'm i'm trying to use this like scraps of memory like yeah i remember hearing that tune but here's my banjo and i'm like when i was in chicago at a, at a bar mitzvah when i was at you know at a cousin's bar mitzvah i heard the man play that and then he comes back home comes back home to texas and you know and tries to put it on his banjo he's not going to remember it all and you know, you know what i mean like and absolutely so that's to me that's the southern experience yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's a, and that's a genuine Southern experience, you know, speaking of the Southern experience, the next tune on our list down South kosher. Oh yeah. I'm supposed to get the guitar for that. So yeah, let me, uh, <laughs> no let, me, let, me let me go get that. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. You know, my folks tried to keep kosher for a while, man, but the, you know, the, the, it was, it was not possible. It was just not possible. Uh, yeah, it was just not possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stillwater, Oklahoma, man. Um, you know, you'd have to go up. Uh, you'd have to go up to Tulsa or Oklahoma City to get stuff. And, but if you wanted meat, you'd have to come in off a bus from Chicago. It was wow. tough. So we. Uh, it's not like the butchers sent you the best cut. You know what I mean? It's not like you're going to be around it. It wasn't going to be like you're going to come down and complain. You know what I mean? So uh, that's a long story we won't get to. But uh, this is a this is a true story right here. Um, uh, once again, off the record. And, uh, you know, my record is filled with a lot of gut punches and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of a lot of hard stuff. 
And I figure that it's important uh, to give a little taste of honey every now and again, give a little something a little funny, something a little humorous. So this is this is humorous, but it's also true. Oh, I should say also the name of this tune is Down South Kosher, A Dance of Hunger and Reconciliation. And there's some context to the tune is that the melody that I took this from is from a, is from a Yiddish dance tune that's played at weddings called the uh, the dance of anger and reconciliation it's 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 done between the two uh, uh mother-in-laws at the wedding and so uh there's a lot of context in my in my music so this is a dance of hunger and reconciliation Die, fry, laid to the side, keeps the southern belly well satisfied. But if you're going to stay Jewish, well, it better suffice to see bacon as a garnish and ham hock as a spice. Tell me, Mrs. Cohen, why is your chewing so nice? I use bacon as a garnish and ham hock as a spice. If you're going to keep kosher, got to work real hard because everything here's got a coat of lard. You make accommodations when you live in the South. Don't ask too many questions about what goes in your mouth. Don't want to stick out. You want to get along. So eat that crawfish and sing my little song. Can't find a bagel worth a tinker's down. Not in the land of the glazed country ham. And the church picnic may be the only meal. They ain't pork chops. Let's call them Pinkville. Hey, Mr. Katz, why you like it so fine? I use lard instead of schmaltz. And I do it all the time. If you're going to keep kosher at the end of your fork, best close your eyes and pay it ain't pork. And if you're going to keep kosher, Better suffice to see bacon as a garnish and ham hock as a help. Bop, bow, da, and do, de, do. You can bop, and do, da, and do. That, yeah, I can hear that that comes from personal experience for sure. We were at a church picnic and, all, and we were 40 miles out of town. And my dad was part of the interface co- interfaith council there in Payne County, Oklahoma. And uh, uh, all they had were, all they had were pork chops. Oh my God. <laughs> and dad said it. Dad said, pink veal. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody asks, if anybody asks, you know, there's a, yeah. So that, uh, that's a, that's a true story. I should mention, um, that, uh, this, uh, that this song and the next song, uh, both are, both have analogous exhibits at my day job. Yeah. Can you tell us about that for a second as a well, living exhibit? What, what is that <laughs> <means>? <laughs> Well, we've been, we've been talking about uh, Southern experience. I just took a, I just, I'm a, I'm a ticket taker at the, uh, at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience, which is uh, which is an amazing place, I think everybody should come down and see it. Um, but uh, that's all I got to say about that. Look it up online and uh, come and see me. I'm there uh, taking tickets, and I'd love to show you the, show you around. And uh, it's uh, uh, it's one of those things that like uh, if you're uh, if you're a Jewish person from someplace else, it's going to blow your mind. Um, you're going to you're going to find out a lot of information. And if you're a Southern person like myself, I think you will be seen for probably the first time in your life. Uh, I think that's the, that's, that's pretty wonderful. And if you're not Jewish, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to learn a lot about uh, that 1%, that million people who uh, live around you down, down here in wow. the South. And uh, they have a, they have this great exhibit about uh, the peddlers who go around and the sign says, Bacon in the morning, bacon for lunch, and bacon in the evening. <laughs> they said because that was all they had to eat. But uh, on a kind of a heavier note, uh, they also have another exhibit on one of the songs that relates to my record, and that is uh, the murder of Leo Frank, 
which is a story uh, that I don't think a lot of people know about. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about it because um, once again, I put a murder ballad on my song, on my record. This is another murder ballad. And uh, uh, there are details that I've, I found out about the trial. And I did mention that there are a lot of Jewish people that play American traditional country music and such. A lot of those people are big fans of a picker named uh, uh, Fiddle and John Carson. And uh, I found out a little detail about uh, Fiddle and John, and I share that in this uh, little piece. And uh, it's called The Murder of, of uh, Leo Frank, and I'll just, I'll just leave it as its own. It stands on its own. All right, here it is. Come gather ground people, a story I should tell. I sing today of Leo Frank, it's a tale not known so well. Well, you may have heard the ballads, or you might have heard the songs about poor little Mary Fagan and how it was that she was wrong. Well, my story's not about the crime, nor about his so called trial. Where Leo Frank, the innocent, was found guilty and given time. Leo Frank is gone, but the memory lingers on. Convicted by all press accounts, railroaded by the court. Where well, thousand came from all around, for Frank's fate was made sport. Well, out on the courthouse steps, old John Carson can be heard Singing songs made right up on the spot for the thousands gathered there He sang, hang that little Jew, let's hang that little Jew Hang that little Jew, he hang that little Jew On the 17th of August, it was on that fateful day Six cars filled up with angry men to the Midgeville prison came. Well, they drained the gas tanks of the cops, cut down the telephone wires, handcuffed the friendly warden, and with Frank they bid goodbye. Outside of Marietta, at a spot they did prepare, there's an old oak branch and a length of rope and a rickety old chair singing they hung that little Jew where they hung that little Jew they hung that little Jew where they hung that little Jew and when the killing had been done all the men they gathered round to get a picture of themselves with Frank's body a dangling down there were prominent politicians, policemen, sheriffs too The captains of local industry and the founder of the local scout troop With the Knights of Mary Fagan, all the clansmen cried with glee Burned a cross up on Old Stone Mountain for all the world to see There singing they hung a little Jew, oh we hung that little Jew well, they hung that little Jew Yeah, we hung that little Jew Well, the Jews of old Atlanta Well, they thought they'd had it made But thousands left old Georgia now For the safety of a northern state There'll be no menorah in your window No more sukkah built outside Them Jews that did not leave right off Learned to hide it deep down in sun Old Leo Frank is gone, but his memory lingers on. For little Mary's Fagin song, John Carson, can we thank? But next time you're at services, say a cottage for Leo Frank. Whoops! Whoops! Sorry yeah, about that. that's okay. Well, it's, there you go. It stands on its own. Wow! And a piece of history that not a lot of people know about. Yeah, it, it, that's that's kind of the job of the artist, in my opinion. 
um, yeah. is, is uh, you know, to kind of uh, point, you know, shine a light, shine a light. If you've got a light, shine a light, you know, and that's, uh, that's my, that's what I'm about. If, if, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. I should mention, I guess this is a good time as any to let you know that part of what, what drives me to do also what I'm doing is, is something of a personal reclamation. Um, because um, there was a time in my life when I was a country and bluegrass musician exclusively. And uh, I, I toured around. Um, I grew up playing this music in some respects. And uh, there was a time uh, when I was, uh, I mean, I, I, I'd experienced anti-Semitism. Um, in bluegrass music, I, it, the kind of the offhand kind. I mean, when Ricky Skaggs says, well, I'd sure like to invite you to this, this jam session back here, but you know, we're all washed in the blood, you know, um, you know, you're kind of offhand kind of, uh, you know, anti-Semitism that you just kind of expect from, from folks like that. But then there's the kind that you don't expect. And this changed the course of my life when, when, when I got hit with this one, I was, um, I was on a tour bus of a label mate. Uh, it was 1999 and I was in Nashville hanging out after the gig. We'd just done a show with this band of a very prominent bluegrass singer by the name of Del McCory, who's very, very well known, uh, and much beloved and, uh, bluegrass performer um, played with Bill Monroe and just is at the top of the just top of the heap. And uh, I was on, I was hanging out with him and his band. And I, I said, you know, Dell, I asked him, I was thinking about moving up here, mo leaving Texas and moving up to uh, Tennessee here and maybe trying to find road work as a traditional bluegrass bassist. Seeing as that's, you know, what, you know, what I was raised up doing, I was, I'd like to see if I could do that professionally, you know, have a go at it. Cause my band at the time was kind of cratering. It's kind of falling apart and I was going to have to do something. It's going to have to do something to make a living. And, uh, I had the requisite skill set. I could sing all the tunes. I knew all the Christ church of Christ, <laughs> you know, gospel tunes. I knew them all. They taught that in the Oklahoma public schools. So I was, <laughs> I was well prepared um, and everybody acknowledged I was a really, really good bass player. And so I sat there and I go, well, Dell, I'm, uh, what do you think? And, and right as I said that you could have heard a pin drop on that bus. And I look over, look around and I just look around and I go, well, Dell, did I say something wrong? And he just, he just put, he just looks at me and he can put a big grin on his face and he goes, well, you know, Mark, we already got a Jewish bass player in Nashville. And I knew who he was talking about, but he didn't play trad music. He, he played new grass music and he was not necessarily, he was a culturally Jewish guy. He wasn't Jewish identified like myself. And I looked at him kind of quizzically and I go, Dell, is it really like that? Are you telling me what I think you're telling me? And he goes, well, we hire out of the church parking lot and I don't reckon we're going to see you there. And I was like, well, that's the end of that. You know, I can either move up here and fight these guys, <laughs> you know, fight my way in to the music of my nurture. You know what I mean? Like fight my way into the music that is that I grew up with. And you know what I mean? Just, you know you know what I'm, you know, certain, you know, the first, you know, the, the music that I grew up with and you know, what am I going to do? And it was about that time. It wasn't too long. It was about that time that Henry Sapoznik had contacted me at class camp and he was a big fan of my group, bad livers. And he was inviting me to come up and join his community up there at, uh, at uh, class camp. And it was one of those, like, well, it looks like I don't have a home anymore you know and so uh what am i going to do so i i went up there and kind of joined in and I, I i i the truth is is that i i i don't come from a klezmer background i don't speak yiddish they didn't you know what i mean i come from a country western and 
polka and punk rock and rock and roll <laughs> background, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, and so my presence in the Klezmer community has always been very strange um, because I had to study it and learn it from the outside because uh, it, it, it's not my natural language, but it, it became the, it became the, the uh, home of my nature as opposed to the, the home of my nurture. So here I am, age 55 and with this project the jew of oklahoma i'm doing i'm i feel like i'm in the home where i should have been in the first place if that makes any sense to you um i'm trying to reclaim a spot not just for myself but for jewish people period i want a slot i want a space at the table if that makes sense i i think that uh that we deserve a voice and that okay. we are, that we, we deserve to be a bass player in a traditional bluegrass band. Um, uh, that that's, that shouldn't be strange. Yeah. And that, uh, that well, you know, I, I'm rambling at this point, but you, no, I think no, no, you no, understand what we, I'm saying. I, I, I didn't want to cut you off though. You, the, just everything you were telling us, I mean, not only is it telling us about your music, but again, you're kind of shining, as you said, shining a light on a particular Jewish experience that isn't oh doesn't always have a light shine sh shined on it shown on it <laughs> shown upon um, shown upon it. Thank you. Um, so I really appreciate it. That being said, we are coming to close to the witching hour, so I'm thinking we have time maybe for one more tune and then question uh, Q and A. Sure. Um, so if, if, if I just want to quickly say, if y'all want to start thinking about your questions, you can either ask them directly to the man. Or start putting stuff in the chat. I know there's already been a few questions in the chat. I'm going to shut up and let Mark play. <laughs> All right. Now, when I was a kid, uh, we just sang, uh, we sang gospel songs in, in, in uh, oh, look at this. Boy, everything's going out to me. We sang gospel songs in, in, in school. And so I learned all these great gospel songs. And uh, some of them are pretty. Some of them are really pretty and beautiful. But, uh, it's, you know, it's part of school curriculum there. But I, I always wanted to have, like, cool, cool songs that Jewish kids could sing. You know what I mean? Like, um, and none of them suited my tastes. So, once again, I'm trying to build a repertoire on each one of my records. Uh, on each one of my records, I'm kind of, like, uh, writing a song, like, kind of like a, a Jewish gospel number that's, that hopefully uh, is cool that people would want to see. And since uh, it's Thursday, we're coming up on Shabbos. Good Shabbos. A good Shabbos Gonna knock off work tonight A good Shabbos Gonna light them candles bright Good Shabbos Gonna rest up with my friends Study Torah till the Sabbath ends Good Shabbos Good Shabbos Good Shabbos Gonna take out time and rest Good Shabbos so that I can be my best. Good Shabbos. Tonight the family dines. Making blessings over the wine. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. On Shabbos. We open up the gates of wine. On Shabbos. To welcome Sabbath bride on Shabbos. Better get on down to shoe. Study up on the golden rule. We're yeah, on Shabbos. On Shabbos. On Shabbos. We unload our woes and cares. On Shabbos. Join the congregation in prayer. On Shabbos. You put that phone on. Way it can wait till another day on oh, Shabbat. On oh, Shabbat, good Shabbat. <laughs> All right, you had a lot of us dancing in our seats, it was really fun to watch. <laughs> Uh, that's my that's that's my Chabad Yechus, man. I'm 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 oh, 
I'm patrilineally descended from a from a great uh, Chabad Reb, rabbi. So that's that's so my I, that's my yichus coming out. That's my yichus coming <laughs> um, out. So I want to go ahead and open it up to our audience. Does anyone want to ask a question? Feel free to either put it in the chat, raise your hand. You can un. I well, I can make it so you can unmute yourselves. Uh, ask I, me anything. Ask me uh, anything. Yes, now you can unmute yourselves if someone wants to jump in with a question. Um, All right, can I ask? Can, can I ask a question, Laurie? Uh, certainly, you've. Alex is coming from London, so he stayed up late for this. Thank well, you, it's, Alex. It's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> wow. wow. And I wanted to do this because whatever Laurie puts on, I support. And he, <laughs> he's got. He's a great Aww. guy, and this Thank is you. so new to me. Not the music, but to find out about the anti-Semitism and the troubles and everything else. I mean, is there any kosher places or any, um, what happens in the shul or what happens within the, the Jewish communities down your way? I mean, surely there must be somewhere to get kosher food or to do this or for, for Shabbat or there must be a Chabad house at least. Well, <laughs> They're everywhere else. Well, when when I was a kid in Oklahoma, uh, we had to drive uh, to. Uh, we only had two Jewish families in our county, so we would kind of get together and just have a little havara, um, you know. Or we would drive to Oklahoma City on Friday night to make Sabbath. Um, we would also pick up uh, a challah. On we'd go we'd go down there for Sunday school. I mean, there were only there's only forty four hundred Jews in the state of Oklahoma right now. Now I live in uh, in New Orleans, and there are eleven thousand Jews in the city of New Orleans, which is half a million people, uh, and we only have one kosher restaurant. One, one. Is, All the, is there, yeah, that's is it. There, um, outward anti-Semitism, or is it sort of covered? Because I remember, I know in Florida it says no Jews, no Blacks, no dogs allowed. So, you know, in the hotels or the country clubs or anything like that. Well, is it the, as blatant the, as that? Well, it was like that when I was a kid. I mean, as late as 1975, 1976, you still saw restricted areas, restricted pools, um, at least in wow. small town Oklahoma. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but I, I'll be honest with you. Um, I don't really exp I'm in the cities. It, this, this is an urban rural issue. And, and my father kind of taught me too, that it's not so much um, uh, anti-Semitism as much as it is just general xenophobia. Um, basically. Um, however, I think in recent days, this has altered. I think this is in the last couple of years. I think this has changed quite a bit. And I think that uh, there's more, that people who held mildly anti-Semitic views are now feeling a lot better about sharing. And I think people are coming up with them a little more lately. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, 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 it's more prevalent here than you will find it elsewhere. Um, and in the colleges and the, and the schools. I, I can't, I, I can't speak for that. I really can't speak for that. I can, I can really only speak for my own personal yeah. experience Right. And and it and, and most most of the I mean I had a cross burned on my yard when I was a kid, and we had bricks thrown through our windows on Hitler's birthday. I knew about 420 when I was, I knew about Hitler's birthday when I was a kid because that's when bricks, you know. My dad used to joke. Oh my. Um, my dad used okay. to joke that he wanted to give uh, give the guys uh, lessons on how to paint swastikas because they always did them backwards. They never did them right. He said he always wanted to catch him, not just to catch him, but to like to teach him how to do it right. Come here, Nudnik. You know, like, yeah, get him like this. You know what I mean? Like they always did it backwards, you know, and 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 that's why he said they're they're not Nazis. They're not Nazis. They're dumbasses. Look, they can't even put the, the swastika upright. So Word, those are uh, more sage words right there. You know what I mean? So so yeah. th th that's what you're dealing with. You're like the cross that they burnt like fell fell apart as soon as as soon as they lit it you right. know what i mean so the, it, Ruby, I, don't, I don't want to cut you off but I, I see a few other people waiting patiently let's sorry, talk sorry, to but it's, let's talk it's, to it's, it's not new thank it's you, so Alex. new to me i'm no, sorry no, no, I, I i and i i'm sure it's new to to many people that's why it's worth certainly worth talking about um sherry mayrent you've been sitting there very patiently go ahead hey, Mark. sherry i'm doing awesome sherry and i hope oh. you're doing great too 
I'm I'm hanging in there. Fantastic. Looking forward to recording with you again before we all die. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> anyway, Deal. I have a musical question for you. Um, yes. In in uh, adapting the banjo to play to play the modal tunes, how did you figure out what tuning to use? That's a great question. Um, I experimented quite a bit, and I settled on a tuning of one of the oldest tunings. It's a minstrel banjo tuning, which is an open. It's an open uh, D chord. Ha ha ha! So it, it's it's the standard banjo tuning, except it's tuned down to a D, which means that uh, I can play uh, D Fregish. But I have not altered the tuning. A bluegrass banjo, you know. the same as a bluegrass tuning it's just i've learned to finger it in our but it's tuned much much lower than a regular banjo and uh, in, in fact they call it a minstrel banjo tuning believe it or not and but, so what uh, would what would you do if you were playing a a, a, a non-friggish song um well i, I uh, for instance uh, i did when i played modally when i was singing that's brent uh, mm -hmm. I get in, I get into a mountain modal tuning, which I take this string and I bring it up. And so you get this. Oh, it's out of Banjo, that's an old Yoruban word for an instrument that plays out of tune. So it's got a it's got this different modality as opposed to which is more western mm -hmm. and so it depends on it depends on what kind of mood that i want to set for instance yeah. when i'm when i'm singing alvino malkenu i want i want that modality but when i'm playing the instrumental numbers i i want to have a, i want to have the ability to play in major So much Thank for you. That Thank you, Sherry. I appreciate the question so much, and uh, so great to hear. So great to hear that you're up and around. Aaron Alquist. Hey, Mark. How's it going? Man, it's fantastic, Aaron. Good. Miss um, you and I will talk offline, but I just wanted you to know, Lori, um, thank you so much for doing this. And I am pushing Mark and continuing to push the Al for Ballad of Leo Frank to be adopted as our theme song. Yeah, Aaron. Aaron is Aaron is doing the good work. He uh, um, he's he's very modest about it, but Aaron works with the uh, Anti Defamation League uh, down here in the South. And uh, if any if any place is really busy, uh, uh, they keep him busy down here. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, probably a little little busier than they do elsewhere. So, Aaron, God bless you. You're doing you're doing doing the Lord's work there, as I'm sure you're aware. And he's a, he's a, he, he's studying the banjo, by the way. So he's a, he'll be a good banjo player soon. I'm sure. Um, well, who else has got a question? Who else has got a well, question? I see a question in the chat. Why don't we make this our last question as we're getting a little late here's This is from Janice Markham. Uh, also great fiddle player. Um, what has the reaction been like where you live in regards to the Southern folk and Yiddish klezmer mashup stylings? It seems as though the feel of the instru uh, instrumentation music, even throwing in a Bulgar beat, lends itself to the various uh, Southern folk styles. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, I'm kind of alone right now. Uh, uh, you know, there's only a few musicians um, who've kind of like uh, jumped on board with me. There's a guy named uh, uh, Craig Judelman, a wonderful old time fiddler that I work with. And uh, I look forward to doing some uh, some explorations with him on my next record and, and a couple other old time musicians to kind of create a lexicon of, uh, of you know, I'm calling it the Jews harp is the name of the next record. And, uh, you know, just you know, to find, a, you know, a lexicon of American Yiddish music, 
uh, you know, American Yiddish string band music and using that kind of thing about the recovered memory, you know, not, not being slavish to these, uh, the melodies, but, you know, the, the same way that you, to use the, to use the folk tradition you know, and, and, and use our own versions of these tunes and adapt them to these instruments and have the same kind of fun that, uh, we, that, uh, sitting around playing Sally Ann in, in uh, ways of the world over and over and over again. <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of our plan. Uh, that's my, that's, that, that would make me most happy is if we, uh, if we as Jews and Jewish Americans, um, would reclaim, um, something of our culture and, and insist that it exists that we be um, that we be understood as not the other, that we're no longer the other, that that you know there there were people that did not uh, review my record because they said they don't uh, uh, they only it wasn't American. I was told to my face that my record was not American music, um, that that it needed to go into the Jewish music section, and that they didn't have a Jewish music reviewer. Um, you know, that's got to end yeah. that, you know what I mean? We're not the other, Amen. we're not the other. Um, my whole, that my whole thing here is we are here, we belong. And by golly, we we're Southern and we are Jewish and we belong and we will reclaim our, you know, our space and our place. And uh, uh, that's, that's my raison d'etre. And, and uh, if anyone on this call wanted to listen to the amazing music that you do in that process, how would they find you? Well, if you go, I'm a band camp guy. So if you go to, if you plug in your uh, face, if you're, your interweb or whatever, however you uh, interface, um, the long system of tubes to get you uh, to where you need to get. Um, if you go to band camp, Jew of Oklahoma, and you will find uh, two of my records there. You're going to find that I've got a lot of records of a lot of different kinds of music, but uh, under the, uh, the two uh, Jew of Oklahoma releases, my latest is uh, uh, the triumph of assimilation. I'm very proud of my record. I work really hard on it. I think it's really prescient. I think uh, it's got a real important message that really needs to get out right now. And I'd be so appreciative if you would pick you up a copy or maybe buy one for a friend, that would be really, that'd be, it'd be it'd warm my heart. And, uh, and, and I, I'd sure appreciate your time and your consideration. Uh, I really thank would. You. Thank you, Mark, so much for doing this program. It's been incredible for all of us. Uh, if y'all want to unmute yourselves and actually clap, feel free. Let's give them a real round of applause. Yeah. I'm just a charm. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just so charmed. I can't tell you. Awesome. You On behalf Yeehaw. of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience Fantastic. Uh, and the National Museum oh, of American Jewish History, it has been our pleasure to present well, Mark Rubin. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm going to buy more music. Well, if the 